Welcome back to Rift Busters, everybody. Thanks for joining. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that was good. I was my, not my, expecting that. My my buddy Chris joining me here on the episode today. We just figure we'll start it out. Uh, fellow, fellow podcaster, and I, I, you know, it's it's funny because I I have like a, a a theme that I have where like I always go, oh, I want to make sure that I give you opportunities to act like this is your podcast. So I, a lot of times I want to make people who come and join me, I want to make them like feel as comfortable and as welcome and as free to be absolutely everything they are and everything they feel just to feel it and have it and never want to make anyone feel like they're not in a safe space or like judgment free area. Yeah. So at that moment, I just figured I might as well turn it over to you early and be like, Hey dude, this is like your podcast now. So just, you're kind of, I'm a, I'm a, maybe, maybe let's just let you lead this one. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, that's, it's fun because one of the things I, I've been doing podcasting so long. And one of the things I love about riff busters, it is like, it is like my Seinfeld of podcasting. It is truly the podcast about nothing. Um, you know, we never, whenever we start recording, we are starting with a clean slate. There's never any like premeditation or, or ulterior motives or anything like that. It's just like, we're live. Let's start talking, my friend. So, yeah. So I think that's a very fitting, uh, you know, kind of linking between your podcast <laughs> as well. Awesome. awesome. Um, yeah, it's fun. I, so I, don't I be afraid I love to the, riff. I love the, I love the free, the freedom of it. And yeah. I think that's, that's may, maybe what I like the most about listening to Riff Busters because it's just so free. It's not, it's not like there's no, like sometimes things you can tell they're so structured. Like yeah. you can, you can taste the manufactured, disingenuous nature in the air yeah absolutely and i the one thing i love about making it too is like we usually because uh jared mccallie my co-host and i we live pretty far apart so we usually record multiple episodes when we're together mm -hmm. and like literally the the episodes are just delineated by like starting and stopping like i will stop mm -hmm. the recording and then start it again and then we just keep rolling so it is a very like natural <laughs> conversational uh, you know one of the most one of the most flattering things i've ever been told by anybody about that podcast is that it feels like you're hanging out in a room with a couple of friends uh it's just awkward because i can't put my two cents in and i was like that's a good feeling i like that <laughs> did, you, did you ever see that meme where it's like a, a girl is like sitting next to like an ice cream chest where the, there's the decals on the front of everybody enjoying the ice cream, and she's sitting there like next to it, like, yeah, yeah. And she's like, "This is what this is what listening to a podcast is like." She's yeah. sitting next to it, all like <laughs> chin on chin on fist. Try, yeah, try. just just developing the the biggest parasocial relationships. Uh, it's great. I love it. Um, yeah. So Riff Busters is definitely the more like laid back one, less structured, more, more chilled out, you know, sort of just hanging out. Uh, and then I have I'm Annoyed uh, with my fiance, which is a great podcast because it's just us bitching for like 45 minutes about whatever's been annoying us over the past week. So it's very cathartic in that sense. Is it, do you guys ever, do you guys ever talk about things about each other that annoy you yourself? Like that, yeah. that like pulls that, that kind of like uncomfortableness about uncomfortability, I guess you'd say. Yeah. It, it pulls up that uncomfortability. They're like, like, oh, oh shoot, is this not, <laughs> is this we not something sure. that should be done in public? <laughs> <laughs> we for sure do that. There was, there has been one episode where uh, afterwards we were like, I got to really go over this with a fine tooth comb and make sure it doesn't sound unlistenable. Like I don't want to be triggering or like traumatic to anybody. So uh -huh. in the, in the relist and I was like, I actually think it's really good because it's honest. Like I'm a, I'm a big fan of that, like clarity and honesty, um, you know, sort of part of things. Um, and then the third one, it's funny that you chose Rift Busters because you had so many options. I have a video gaming podcast and Twitch channel called up and up pod where uh, we stream three days a week. We have a pretty good community there. And every once in a while, we do like a gaming news podcast. Oh, so cool. Riff Busters. I, I think it's the wrestling talk that has drawn you to Riff Busters. It's funny how like <laughs> it, how much wrestling infiltrates things because I probably haven't watched a wrestling event 
the last wrestling event I watched was the the WrestleMania where the Undertaker retired. And then before that, it was probably high school. Um, but we still talk about it. Attitude Era was like formative to me, which I don't know if that means I'm a good person or a bad person. Oh, but... you know, you know, <laughs> it's 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 such a it's such a it's such a big spectrum. There's no you're, yeah. you 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 can't land on one end or the other. You're always right in the middle of yeah. like, all right, I, I I'm doing my best here. <laughs> <laughs> but but wrestling can raise you i do i remember when i was a kid um my 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 neighbor was watching wrestling and there was it was during a, a road dog promo you know the mm. road the new age outlaws they were doing the ladies and gentlemen boys and girls children of all ages and the kids were all doing it and they were like when it was billy gunn's turn to say if you're not done with that we got two words and the kids were going to their dad they're like can we dad can we say it can we, <laughs> can we say it along and i was like and his dad was like go ahead and the little kids were like suck it they were like little little kids dude <laughs> it's, were... it's the best i don't know if you're a basketball fan but every time in the playoffs when joel Embiid would would hit him with a suck it after a mm -hmm. after like posterizing somebody or something like that i was just like this is the best i love it so much like that's it, it gets me so pumped like that that energy of the suck it has not gone away was was joel and bead the same one who was wearing the um the undertaker mask yeah when undertaker, yeah when undertaker got crushed yeah. by yokozuna <laughs> yeah for the same reason too <laughs> yeah he uh fractured his eye socket multiple times and then they were like if you do it one more time you have to quit playing basketball it was like it was the funny the fun funny part about it was like i was making fun of him because he kept taking it off and he's like oh this hurts and i was like imagine <laughs> the imagine undertaker be in the mid-match going taking this off oh you know, gosh oh, owie, oh gosh owie. darn it oh frick. <laughs> oh gosh darn it right to heck he's <laughs> he's one of those ones too man when when the kayfabe broke and i heard what he like was what he his real voice sounded like and stuff I, it it changed him for me forever he like i couldn't see him as the dead man anymore like that instantly he was uh the biker taker for me from that moment forward because i was like oh you just you sound like so many of my stepdad's friends can't, can't put the genie back in the bottle for you yeah not at all <laughs> <laughs> i think I think I've come to accept, and this is a word I've made up, but I really would like it to become a thing that everyone knows and everyone says. Uh, I think it's become the lines have blurred so much mm -hmm. that it's 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 gray fabe. I I heard you on on this podcast actually uh, <laughs> use that term, and I was yeah. like, that's fucking genius because it's I, such a it's such a. It's such a good term for like the way social media changed the way wrestlers mm -hmm. have to approach everything. Yeah. Like it I hope, they don't I hope, it, I hope it catches on and I hope I get a little bit of something for it catching on. <laughs> <laughs> but it is it a great feels term, the though. most appropriate way yeah. to describe what the, the the it's it's not just with wrestling. It's with everything. You never know oh. what entertainers to be, it's all it's all inside of like, am I in character? Am I the public persona? Kayfabe, grayfabe, boom, there you go. Yeah, I mean, it's funny you bring that up because I feel exactly that way. Like uh, being a, a comedian and a podcaster and a school teacher, entertaining is kind of something that I do in pretty much every aspect of my life, like to some extent. So that idea of like, yeah, there's a little bit of Chris William, the comedian that shows up in, in my classroom. And there's a little mm -hmm. bit of the teacher, you know, Mr. William, that shows up on stage. Mm -hmm. I did a, I did a show a couple months ago. It's very funny. So I have this, um, I have this thing called aphantasia, and I wrote yeah. a bit about it. Um, mm -hmm. Aphantasia, if you don't know what it is, is the absence of a mind's eye. Um, so I have no imagination. I can't like picture an image in my head. Mm. It doesn't happen. Um, hmm. And then I went on to find out that it also means that I don't have an internal monologue like there. I have thoughts, but there's just no like sound to the thoughts hmm. and I can't talk and think at the same time. That doesn't work. Hmm. Um, so uh, I did. Like, that's, that's how to make life like hard. Has that that's always been that way? I, I my whole life I've never had an imagination and I've never had like an internal monologue. It It's funny because I'm I'm like. I never knew otherwise. And when I found out this was a thing, I became super jealous of everyone around me. 
Um, just because like I thought that like what was happening here was like par for the course. I well, thought Chris, this was what, normal. What you get though, Chris, is you get you get to have a level of love and passion for movies that no one else can ever understand. Yeah. Oh, you're that, not wrong there. So your connection to being entertained is way more sincere. It's way more like pop me in on pop me in on that that joy ride. I really yeah. want to sh- strap in for that. Yeah, it's so funny you bring that up because l- I had this conversation recently with my uh, my fiance because we went to see everything everywhere all at once and it did mm-hmm. not click for her, which I understand. Um, but I like it is one of probably the for me the most important movies I think I've ever seen in my life. Like it's really high up there for me on favorites lists. Uh-huh. And she was and she was like, oh, like twenty minutes in, I just started like thinking about this other movie and like literally like she like I imagined a movie oh, that I man. liked. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, I'm kind of oh, glad I can't do that like, because I would just good for off. good for you. <laughs> yeah, she rubs it in every chance she can. Um. But why you brag? To, why you bragging? Yeah, the the teacher aspect of it was uh I wrote this joke originally and it was less like informative. It was just like explaining aphantasia and then talking about uh what it's like and then asking me essentially the the big payoff for the joke is is me talking about I found out that it works with sound and I asked the audience it's it requires a little crowd work but I asked the audience like does it work for music? Can you guys can you guys think of a song and then hear that song play in your head? And then people, you know, by applause or response, uh, let me know. And I'm like, why the fuck do you pay for Spotify? <laughs> and uh, it's, it, you know, it works well, but uh, I did a, I did a set a few months ago where it became in the middle of my bit, it became a Q and a session where people are like raising their hands and asking me <laughs> questions about how my brain works. I mean, I mean, that you kind of asked for it. Yeah, I, I did. And <laughs> yeah, I, I, you yeah. know, I really, I, I truthfully, like, I really enjoyed it because it was, it was it, a comfortable moment too. Like everybody yeah. there has that to take with them. I mean, aphantasia, I, I don't know if I'll hang on to that word past today, today yeah. but I hope to. Yeah. Don't worry. If you ever speak to me again, I will remind you that I have it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> people, uh, people don't believe that it's a thing. Like, I've talked about it on Rift Busters and stuff. My co-host is like, that sounds made up. And I'm like, I understand that it sounds made up. It also sounds made up that you can picture things in your head. But that- it also, you know, well, the other thing that makes it sound made up is that the Mickey Mouse movie Fantasia's name yeah. is right in the middle of the disorder. Yeah, that was uh, part of the nomenclature, I guess, when they planned the naming of it. They wanted to reference, you know, the visual masterpiece that is Disney's Fantasia. And maybe that's why I never liked the movie. As a kid, I was always like, this is fucking boring. I, it used to give me headaches, dude. I yeah. remember being like, yeah, what what what's cool about this? Like what what story is happening? Like what? I yeah. mean, I I know when I last time I saw it, I was a child. I was a little tiny. I was maybe six or something when I saw it. But I remember being like, no one's talking. This yeah. isn't. This I want to see a talking mouse. I don't want to see a musical mouse. <laughs> yeah, get out of here! Uh, unbelievable, so unbelievable musical mouse. <laughs> so uh, just the hardest agreement with you there, my friend. But yeah, so uh, that is definitely, like I said, uh, the big example I can think of, like a time where like teaching fully infiltrated my time on stage because mm-hmm. it took a it took probably 15 minutes of my 20 minute set just like answering people's questions and then after the show people were still coming up to me and talking to me about it and asking yeah. questions and like it was so interesting it was very like the first question i always get is like so what happens when you do like try to picture something i was like i just like i get i gather facts about that like if someone asked me to think of an apple or to imagine an apple i'm like I don't know, round, they grow on trees, typically like red or green. Um, and then uh, and people give them to teachers, and that's what you are. <laughs> yes, exactly. So most likely there's been one on your desk. Oh yeah, I'm very familiar with an apple. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh it's an interesting it's an interesting way to go through life for sure, especially when like but not until you find out you have it. Like well, before... I, gotta, I gotta imagine also uh, pardon me, I'm sorry. No, you're but... fine. I have to imagine it makes uh, doing a doing a set so difficult. Yeah, like trying to trying to memorize how you want to go, like what what jokes you want to do, or 
or the order in which you even word the joke. Yeah, I mean, it is for sure like one of the reasons why I do write out a set list before I go on stage because uh, I've found comedy has really helped me with this, but writing is like the greatest way to tie something to memory for me. Like if I hand write it out, I am I'm far more likely to remember it. So like my like when it comes to writing a joke, the way it, it typically happens is it gets typed in my phone as a premise first. And then I sit down with my notebook and I write out a joke word for word how I think it would go on stage. And then I go on stage and I riff it out. And then I go back and rewrite and I always record and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, when it comes to like rem like the order of jokes, I am like very dependent on a set list. You know, I just take I take a sheet out of my moleskin and I fold it. Uh, I fold it so it's broken up into eight squares on each side. And then I just write my set list on that little square of paper and I lay it on the stool when I go up just so I know the order of the jokes that I want to tell. Well, I saw you doing I saw you doing a thing that I also do, which is holding an index card in, in like your hand where the mic's at. So it's kind of it's yeah. kind of hidden by your hand. It's kind of hidden by your hand. Yeah, I do that as well. I do whatever I can to, you know, help make sure that I remember everything. You know what I mean? I, I remember the first like the first kind of important or big show that I did, I actually did the, like, write the, write the set list on the side of your forearm. Mm. Like I wrote like the bullet points. Cause mm -hmm. all I need, <clears throat> one thing that's nice is that my memory is, is decent enough that, and I've been doing comedy long enough that I can see the bullet point and then it brings back the whole joke to me. So I don't have mm -hmm. to like write anything more than just like whatever I've titled the joke at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So that's super convenient. Um, but it's, you know, I, I I also, as I've gotten better with comedy and as I've been doing it much longer, um, there's like a tremendous freedom as well into like, oh, I'm just going to riff it out tonight. Like now, typically when I come up with a new joke, um, it's it, it's at a premise when I do it on stage for the first time. And then that is I will do like a live writing sort of situation for it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which sucks sometimes because I, I don't always remember to start my recorder before I go up on stage, but, um, you know, I, I forget, I forget it's sometimes like I, I have moments I have like spout, I have like spurts where like, it's important as hell to record every sentence. And there's sometimes I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go figure it out up there and have to yeah. kind of experience it. And a lot of times I don't even have those, those <laughs> there's differing thoughts on it. I'm like, yeah, I don't even think I'm going to let it happen. I'm just letting it happen. Yeah. Okay. Oh, for sure. And I, I think, you know, do, I don't, how long have you been doing stand up for? I, I like six years, seven years. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'd say probably, probably as somebody, I'd consider myself a comedian, like probably 2017. Okay. But what, but when I first got on stage for the first time, and then when I, so I got on stage for the first time in 2008. Okay. And and I got a, I got up a bunch then, and then I then I took a little break and I came back in 2012, and uh, and then I came back to wrestling. So I didn't. I was I was scratching that itch. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, so I, I I put comedy down for a while, and I picked it back up, in like 2017 maybe. Okay. 16 and 17. Yeah, I was just asking because I, I have found that for me, uh, I've gotten very comfortable as a performer. The only time I get nervous is when I like fully give in to the improvisation part of it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when I've done like improvised comedy shows where they like pull names out of hats, uh, you know, Harrisburg Comedy Zone, shout out to Mike O'Donnell and uh, Manny Santiago. They run a, a fun show called Shit in a Hat where they like pull. I know, I know, Mike. I know Mike O'Donnell. Do you? Yeah, That's yeah. Awesome. Uh, Good dude. He, he used to he used to run the Comedy is Liberty at uh, the Truck. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But I knew him even before that. Back, yeah, back in the day. Like I think we, him and I both might made it. Maybe might have started around the same time. Okay, that makes sense. Uh -huh. Um, but yeah, so they do like it's called shit in a hat. They pull index card like the audience and other performers write stuff down. They pull the card out of the hat, and then you have to do an improvised set based on the subjects they pull out of the hat and uh 
that's the only way I feel nervous on stage anymore, which is kind of fun. Like that's the adrenaline rush of comedy to me is like the, like not knowing what you're doing and having to figure it out while you're up there. Um, also kind of, you know, trying to win back a bomb. Like I fuck, I bombed my ass off at my open mic last night that I host. I, I did. I did so bad. I think it had something to do with the sun still being up, but also I was just like, it's like, man, oh man, these like, I, it got to the point where I was like, that was the punchline of the joke. Just so you know, audience, like that <laughs> was supposed to be where you left. That was your cue. My bad. I messed that up though. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, man. The, the 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 spot i did on sunday like the people were just staring at me like i i hit the punchline and they would just continue just staring right at me and yeah. i was like oh oh and the thing was i was like my the biggest fear i had for a really long time as i said i didn't want to i didn't want to i didn't want to listen to see me bomb mm. and i was like i wouldn't i would tell her like i wouldn't tell her that I was going and doing comedy and I wouldn't like invite her to come with me. But this one, I was like, all right, fine. You can come with me. If you see me bomb, you see me bomb. And then sure enough, saw me bomb. Yeah. Just boo me. If yeah. this is to the audience, if anyone out there listening, if you see me at a show and you're not enjoying it, don't just sit in silence. Boo me. I would rather that. I would prefer you booing me because I can do something with that. I can't do shit with silence. Right. Shout, I, shout out a, Shout out a premise you want me to riff on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who's line this bitch? Come on, yeah. <laughs> give me a give me a person, place, and a uh, job. Um, Unknown. So, my question for you, similarly to kind of like how I was discussing, um, you know, with with teaching and comedy, kind of like inter uh, interloping. Your wrestling persona i've ne i've seen you do comedy i have not seen you wrestle i'd like to change that someday but what uh do you take that on stage at all like when you're wrestling do you um because it'd be re it'd honestly be real fucking weird if you took wrestling onto the comedy stage with you well you just started giving like you're just like you're not laughing at me bitch and you're german <laughs> suplexing people like off the stage but, but the thing is like in wrestling i i kind of i am I, I I don't know if I've ever come to this realization before right now. So I'm uh, this is coming to you in real time. I think in wrestling, I'm so fine with being booed and hated. Okay. And in in comedy, I want to be like so bad. <laughs> so yeah. it kills me. And it's like, and it's like, I think in both things though in the exact in the exact same way like the the way a crowd reacts to a, a cool move is that the, the same way a crowd reacts to a good joke or a good reaction to any joke uh <clears throat> doesn't necessarily have to be a good joke but <laughs> just the reaction right. uh, the, the 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 same the same pistons flare in my spirit yeah okay but, that's interesting so are you a heel then you wrestle as a oh heel? yeah Oh that yeah, makes sense. I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't. I think for the most part, like I, I feel like being a babyface is like. I don't know. I felt like that was like a a young guy's thing. Like I felt like it was it was my job when I was a young guy to be a babyface all the time, yeah. and then get taught by the by the vets who were leading me as a heel. Yeah. And now I think it's my duty as the old heel, to, lead these these younger guys yeah it's it's funny too how like i similarly i i feel very similar in my approach to comedy too like uh you know the whole aspect of like you know wrestling you know going back to the booing thing is like again i just want a reaction right like on stage like don't get me wrong a laugh is perfect a laugh is ideal but if you're not going to give me that give me something and I feel like that's kind of the same kind of mentality as a wrestler, right? Is like if you're gonna if you're gonna boo me, boo me. Like that will still give me energy. That still feeds my soul. Like that still that still energizes me. Well, it, um, it's tough. It's tough because like sometimes you wrestle in front of like there's like no audience. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're you're wrestling just to like for the uh, in, in the uh, in like the the autopilot. Like where you like know that this is the structure in which we built 
and this is the structure and psychology that a match would go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe there's maybe there's like, I, dude, I've wrestled in front of like two people. <laughs> Yeah, it's really, I've it, similarly done comedy in front of two people. So yeah, same. same. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's funny that it's like that. Just a compulsion. You can't not do it. <laughs> like I'm right. not gonna. I'm here. Like, I'm not gonna not do it. Like, I'm not doing this for you. Just so you know, you <laughs> yeah, two people. Just yeah, so you know, yeah. I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me. Yeah, I'm this selfish. is a me thing. <laughs> this is a this is a me a, a me ego scratch of an itch. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but has similar, nothing to do with you. The the mentality you you have right of the the old heel and it is your duty to like help along the the young baby face. Uh, mm-hmm. I very much feel the same way in comedy. You know, twenty nine years old. I'm not that old, but I started doing comedy when I was twenty two. So I've been doing comedy for a while. So I love when there's like new people in the scene that I can like kind of just talk to and give advice to and like um you know similarly i don't mind being a villain on stage like i think personally that's one of the things that and maybe you feel this way as such a nice person like i'm not trying to like you know suck you off or anything on your podcast you're truly like a very kind nice human being well so i'll accept it i'll it's, accept it <laughs> so yeah. it's funny to hear that you play heel but and then in my head i immediately go well I like being an asshole on stage. Like sometimes I will structure jokes where I'm the mean person because I think that there is humor in that alone. Like I have this very, I have literally a baby face. Like I look like a a child. I've got this big soft body. I usually wear like cardigans and like, I just look very like comforting. I, I look safe. I sound safe. And then when I get on stage and I talk about just being a piece of shit, like I find humor in that. I I like kind of playing a heel in comedy, just because you don't expect it when you look at me. Like it's not what anybody is expecting. But then you like, it gets me in trouble sometimes. Like I I'm a I'm a huge. I fall into the trap of, uh, I will roast comedians, especially if I'm like hosting the mic. I'm not afraid. I won't shy away from roasting people or like making fun of them before or after their set, <laughs> and like. The way my brain works, it is the old cliche of like, if I'm taking the time to write a joke about you, that means that I like you. Like a sixth grade boy with a crush on a girl. (laughs) Right. right. If you're (laughs) worth the currency of like my time and I'm going to sit here and like structure a joke to like make fun of something you said on stage or something about you as a person, that's a huge sign that I like you. But I also understand that that hasn't been explained to you yet. So sometimes I roast people and then like afterwards I will get like a message on Facebook or like next time I see one of their friends, I'll be like, yeah, do you hate David? I'm like, no, I think David is fucking amazing. I think he's so funny and such a cool guy. And they're like, David, oh, cause yeah, they're like, oh, cause you really hurt his feelings. And I was like, oh man, I didn't mean for that to happen. Uh, <laughs> leave your feelings outside when you yeah. come in where stand-up comedy's happening oh it dude and it, it's so much like streaming on twitch we do a lot of community streams where we bring people who have like been with us as we've grown as a twitch channel we bring them into streams where we will play like party games or large party games like among us and jackbox and stuff like that and it's again one of the things where i am an entertainer first and foremost that is where my brain goes like i I'm my goal is to make sure that this is enjoyable for somebody to watch. So I will like make a joke and I will tease somebody. We had somebody on stream a few weeks ago um, say that it, it was just coming up. I forget how exactly it came up, but they were like, everybody deserves a set. Everybody has some good in them. And I was like, yeah, not everybody. Now I believe that in real life, but the character I'm playing, you know, on the K- the gray fabe, I'm like, not everybody. And the person was like, yes, there is. I'm like, I would beg to differ. Hitler had zero redeeming qualities. (laughs) There was, I was like, the guy was a painter. Do you really want to say like the guy who killed 6 million Jews was also a decent painter or that he liked dogs? I'm sorry, but that doesn't matter to me. That is not, that is not a gem of good that outweighs any of the bad he did as a person. (laughs) So then afterwards, that person messaged me privately and was like, hey, are you really mad at me about that comment? I was like, no, that was a bit. <laughs> I was just doing jokes. Well, the, the, guy, the, the person must have felt like you had been really 
<laughs> you had been really offended about his about the Hitler the Hitler thing. Yeah, also I was saying is that some people don't have any redeeming qualities. <laughs> I think I think a, a struggle that I that I have when it comes to to comedy is I think that um all right. I I'm I'm such a huge fan of stand-up comedy. I've been I I think around around the t I was like, "Okay, I'm going to be a stand-up comedian." That's what I decided. I'm going to do that with the rest of my life. I will be a stand-up comedian. I found wrestling like 2 years later, and I was like, "All right, I'm going to be I'm going to be a pro wrestler." So and it was, was like I, go I was going to say just was what was so was entertainment always a dream? Was it yes. always like some kind of entertainer you wanted to be mm -hmm. for your job? Yes. Yes. Well, the thing was, is like, I think that I didn't find. I Okay. Me, me wanting to, to be a comedian and me like wanting to perform and, 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 and stuff. I didn't feel like that was me in wrestling yet. I didn't feel like I was good enough to have that yet. Like I had to like earn that. Mm -hmm. And I like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like I had to earn that by, constantly getting in there and doing it it was like i had to be out there and i had to i had to meet like i i feel like most of my education from the wrestling business comes mm -hmm. from getting out there and doing it like the experience the experience is way better teacher than any than any seminar i could have ever been in yeah completely agree uh, i mean not i don't know anything about wrestling but comedy a hundred percent Right. Like you like get up on stage and fail a whole bunch. That's going to be right. way better for you to learn than paying $125 for some local celebrity six week course. Um, it, you know, it's, it's spot on. There are plenty, <laughs> there are plenty of people who have comedy careers who've been in courses like that. And there's mm -hmm. plenty of people I know who participate in courses like that. And, and then, you know, like, Live to regret it a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, uh, I mean, I think, I think everyone, everyone has something good about them. <laughs> everyone <laughs> has some redeeming qualities. <laughs> Even people who take six week courses. Train... <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's funny too because I said here just being the biggest hypocrite because a uh, a university I am going to be an adjunct professor at Bucknell University in the fall, oh, teaching yeah, a cool. class about stand up comedy as a uh, performing art and therapy. <laughs> I'm, and, I'm teaching, and it. you were just saying, "Don't take anyone's course. No, <laughs> don't even take mine." <laughs> But it's it's with a philosophy professor who I who I've done stuff with in the past. And, um, you know, I, I that environment, I think, is. OK, because one, 95 percent of the kids in that class don't want to be a comedian. We're forcing right. them into it. And right. like a couple of the kids will catch it. You know what I mean? That's what's happened in the past is a few students catch the bug and and mm. keep performing and sticking with it. But. <clears throat> seeing like like people being forced into performing and then still getting better even though they don't really care about comedy is such an interesting thing because i have seen so many open mic comedians who claim to care about comedy and haven't gotten better <laughs> you know what i mean like this kid who doesn't care mm -hmm. is is getting better but like dude you've been doing it for five years and you're still doing that joke that hasn't ever gone well that's crazy uh so the the part was i was saying uh being being uh somebody who always wanted to be a comedian i i understood that the 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 rules were sort of like were like oh if, like you get too you get in too good a shape or if like you're too handsome or you're too attractive or whatever the adjective you want to choose mm. then like you then you sacrifice some funny you yeah. sacrifice some relatability and like i am afraid that anybody who hears me or watches me uh can look at me and just judge this real quick and not know that like i grew up like a, a like a skinny fat sweaty weirdo with big thick glasses and a stupid <laughs> haircut like i i'm i'm this now but it took me 
uh, it just happened overnight. Like I didn't, I was not this. And then all of a sudden I was this. Yeah. But that. <laughs> no, I, I'm such a firm believer in like anybody can do it. Anybody can be funny. I do mm -hmm. hate that notion that like, oh, you have to be, you can't be like an attractive person or you can't be a health, like you can't be a fit person or whatever the case may be. But like, similarly, one of the times I did like a guest lecture at in this course before I am like the co-teacher for it, there was a girl and I was 24 at the time. She was 22. So it's not creepy to say very hot, like a very, very attractive college age girl. And she just like did a six minute set about how like unattractive she is and how nobody wants to have sex with her. And I was like, here's the thing. I was like, this is going to sound creepy coming from me. And I'm going to just steer into the skid here. And I'm going to say that those jokes are not jokes you can do because nobody is going to believe that. Like, you can be an attractive person and do comedy, but it has to still be believable. Like, you can't be a hot person up there talking about how nobody wants to fuck you because you're a liar. Like, you absolutely are. Like, it, 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 that's just the case. Like, you're just going for what's easy writing and that's disingenuine, right? Um, but I'm also a firm believer in like you have to like embrace whatever it is people are going to notice about you. My opener is always about being a fat guy because I'm a fat guy. And I know 100 percent that 90 percent of the audience, whenever I walk on stage, goes, do you think he knows how fat he is? <laughs> so, of course, that's my icebreaker. My first joke is always going to be acknowledging being a big guy. Right. And that's like new comics. If any are listening out there. The biggest advice is your opener should be acknowledging whatever that is about you. If you've got thick ass glasses, write a joke about it. If you're balding, write a joke about it. If I, you know you've got I'll chicken usually, legs I'll, and a big upper I'll body, usually, I'll usually say, uh, "I'm uh, adjacent Momoa." Adjacent Momoa is here. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's so. That's so. Adjacent Momoa is so fucking funny. Yeah, and it's so spot on for you too, man. That's like that's like a perfect, like or or or, or I'll say awkward man. <laughs> Somebody could hear those and picture you having never seen you, and it would be so close to accurate. <laughs> this is the sweatier version of Aquaman. Yeah, <laughs> awkward man. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. It it it's so like exactly that though. Just like acknowledge whatever it is about you that people are going to notice first and that like just gets so much more comfortable with the audience but I, i'm also not one i'm like the opposite of most people who are comedians most people are like not everybody should be doing comedy and i'm so hard the other direction of like everyone should do it i think everyone should have to work a service industry job and i think everyone should do stand-up comedy <laughs> i yeah, i think there's nothing like, wrong with it. it like it's like there's a certain like there's a like a breed of breed of folks who will rise to the very top and mm -hmm. be actually like find the ones who are meant to do it if you let everybody do it. For sure. Well, and but, I also I, I also think too that like there is like a, just a, a a some net gain by doing comedy. Like even if I'm never famous, even if I'm never doing comedy as just my job, my life has been improved so greatly by doing comedy. Like I'm so much more comfortable with who I am as a person. I have so much more confidence. I have like so many more people skills. Um, I'm not afraid of public speaking anymore, which used to be like my second biggest fear next to spiders. Um, like, so, so truthfully, like even if comedy isn't anything for me financially more than it already is, it has made my life immeasurably better. That very, very same I say about pro wrestling. Yeah. I'd say, dude, I've never made good. I've never made good money wrestling. Like I've never, I've, I've never made a living off of wrestling. I've always had some Joe job on the side, yeah. like, or not on the side. That's my, like wrestling was on the side. Wrestling was a hobby. And I, and I always was like, oh, I never have to make up. I never have to come up with a backup plan. Cause wrestling is going to be the thing that I make it with for the rest of my life. I said that when I was 16 years old and and uh i've been doing it but you know i got a i got a collection of name tags and hair nets like wayne like wayne campbell <laughs> uh so on that same vein though who's the most famous person you've ever wrestled ever wrestled yeah 
Oh, dude, I'm gonna I, I, I'm gonna say somebody and then I'm gonna forget. Um, if it gets any, I don't know. I've been I've been in the ring with Cesaro a bunch. That's awesome. Um, uh... <laughs> Bill, I just want to acknowledge Bill Miller's duck in chat has been has been consistently providing content and i i'm, I'm loving it and i just want to acknowledge his existence okay is he, he just said say my name act like i'm huge <laughs> <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> I'm, sorry whenever whenever i'm whenever i'm on on a, a podcast or uh stream yard or recording anything i'm too i'm too i have i have too much of a deficit of attention to yeah. pay attention to whatever the chats are oh, like yeah. i I wish I possessed that ability to continue to have a quality conversation while being distracted and uh, multi multitasking enough yeah. to be able to do something like that. But it's tough. Uh, I, 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 from streaming so much, I've gotten mm -hmm. really good at it, but <laughs> like, see my co-host Ty just chimed in from our Twitch channel saying he completely agrees with you. He's the same <laughs> way. I'm the, I'm definitely the, like the <laughs> chat guy. Like yeah, even on nights uh, where he's in charge of the stream, mm -hmm. I will have chat up on my second screen when we're when we're streaming, and I will be the one acknowledging and like talking to people. You know what's uh, funny? I I have two screens that are both this video that were yeah. that were <laughs> one's and you then, and one's uh, me. Uh, no, no, no. They're both both oh. <laughs> both screens. So I was like, oh, I, I could I could be actually looking at the other thing, but nah. Yeah, why bother? I, because I was still I was still lose focus and. And, yeah, uh, be a shitty hang. Yeah, it's just Bill Miller's duck and tie anyway. Who cares, right? <laughs> do you know? Do you know? Do you know Bill Miller? No, I don't. But I'm a fan of him already, just off oh. of his his input in chat. Yeah. Oh, Bill Miller's dick. He is a big deal. Don't let him act like he isn't. <laughs> so Cesaro, you think is the most famous? Well, um, wrestler you've been I, in the ring I, with? I've been in I've I've been in the ring a ton with uh, the guy who you know as Damian Priest now. Okay. Uh, I've had a bunch of matches with him. Uh, were you ever on the same uh, card as anybody that you were like starstruck? Um, not really. No. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I've been, I've been on, I've been on shows that like. <laughs> this is a funny story. My 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 old roommate, one of my one of my best friends. He's uh we were we were on a show um that uh Billy Gunn was on the show. Oh. And, he, and it was it was like Christmas time and Billy Gunn came out with a Santa Claus hat on and he was like if you're not down with Santa Claus or Christmas, we <laughs> got two words for you. <laughs> and and then everybody said, Suck it. And and Lee looked at me and he was like, I'm not down with Santa Claus or Christmas. I guess Billy <laughs> Gunn says, suck it, juice. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's so uh, that's so good. Fuck. Uh, man, I like it frustrates me a little bit how just naturally funny it seems some wrestlers are. Like I, I think a I think a lot of them are naturally super funny people. They're incredibly talented athletes and wrestlers first and foremost but i think they're also very very funny people and it makes me mad because i'm just funny first <laughs> and that's it <laughs> perhaps you're 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 being a little hard on yourself you're comparing yourself to others too often yeah i mean that's that's the human condition uh, yeah. i think <laughs> yeah well you know i think we should put some of that down a little bit we should, yeah we can we can break the chains yeah. <laughs> of generational trauma. Yeah. That uh, man. Yeah. Years of therapy. <laughs> We're working on it. We'll get there at some point. It's got they've gotten looser. I can, you know, move my wrists and stuff now. Like if you weren't if you hadn't made all the decisions that you'd made and you'd made them the way someone else had made their decisions, who's to say you wouldn't have failed quicker or fell flat on your face? It's like that's that's the lane that works for that person. Yeah. And and your yours is the one that works for you. Dude, and that was one of the most important breakthroughs I ever had in therapy. I like 
I was driving to a show in Harrisburg to make twenty dollars in my shitty nineteen ninety nine Ford Taurus, and the year was two thousand and fourteen, uh, and I ran into a kid I went to high school with who like didn't go to college, but was a manager at like a construction company and had like a six figure salary and like a wife and kids and a house and drove away in a brand new Dodge Charger from our interaction and like that fucked me up for like days and then i went to see my therapist and i talked about it and she was like why you don't want anything he has like you don't want to work construction you don't want kids you don't want to own a house it would be hilarious to see you driving a charger like (laughs) (laughs) she was like why why and i was like i don't know because that's like traditional value and she's like you got to stop that and then from that moment forward i was like all right man like exactly what you said like I love the situation that I have right now and I wouldn't be here without the decisions that I've made. So I don't regret any of them, but uh, yeah, I just, it's weird. I do think comedy, it's funny because I, you know, it was, it wasn't like a real fight. It was one of those joke fights, but my fiance and I got into uh, one of those, you know, late night, you're laying in bed, you're chatting while the lights are off. And she was like, what do you think the best decision you ever made was? And I was like, doing comedy. And she's like, not dating me. And I was like, that's second. Well, but do- she was she was trying to bait you. <laughs> she was trying to bait you on that one. That's some 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 real gaslit, yeah. gaslit tactics there. No, she was she was it, <laughs> she was doing bits. She's a very funny person, but uh-huh. it was yeah. it was for sure a situation where where genuinely she was like, because you know, she was just making conversation. And I was like, no, but I think like also too, like doing comedy has helped our relationship a ton. Yeah. Like it has given me something to do and that I care about. And it has made me a better person. Like there's no doubt in my mind. And like, uh, it has helped just like with neuroses and stuff like that. You know what I mean? I feel like I'm way less neurotic of a person since I've started doing it. That's such a cool way to look at it. It's a, and, and that'll be helpful to those kids that you're trying to teach that yeah. it's a, it's, it's really a good treatment for depression. Cause for sure. at the same time, dude, it's, I mean, very, very, very on the mirror to that. It can be depressing as shit. Mm-hmm. It can be depressing as shit when you're like, Oh, these people don't like me. Oh, when you, dude. when, when you're, when you're doing Santa, you're, you're you. Like you, yeah. those premises are yours. You thought they were good enough. Yeah. You thought they were good enough, and you go up there, and they don't like them. It, I, I yeah. truly, I, this is not a joke. I think, I think it would be less vulnerable to stand on stage nude than it is to do comedy. Yeah. Um, you know, one of one of the like lowest points I've ever kind of actually been like emotionally was as a result of comedy. Going off of what you said, I was at an open mic, and it had ended, and I was hanging out with friends. And a person in the audience who comes to every open mic walks up to the table we're sitting at. And there's five of us at the table. Four of us performed. One of us didn't. And he he shakes the hand of every other person at the table and says, you did great tonight. You did great tonight. The person who didn't perform said, I wish you would have performed tonight. I would have loved to see you. You did great tonight. You did great tonight. And then walks away and doesn't say a word to me. And that haunted me. I was Mm. like, like. I drove home from the mic that night. I was like, I think I'm just going to quit comedy. I think I'm done with it. I think I'm done. My buddy was like, because one bald asshole didn't say you did good. Some dude trolled you. Yeah. He like went out of his way to say that to everybody, to not say it to you in order to be a troll. Yeah, for sure. IRL troll. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But that was one like you're, you're not kidding when like the lows, the lows are low and the highs are high. It's a very manic thing. Yeah. Um, Comedy is, but. You know, we, I, I, the secret to it is you got to all re- you got to start out already being famous and already yeah. have a following. <laughs> like I, yeah. that feels like the beginning of every book about being a stand up comedian. They're like, OK, start by having at least 10 million followers on Twitter. Yeah. 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 I it's got, ridiculous. I, yeah. I got a couple hundred. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or or be well or like be able to have enough money to be able to give up everything except right. comedy. Right. I'm like, well, then no, I guess I'll never be famous, but I'm fine. I'm fine being, you know, local, you know, local yokel who's just does it and takes it very seriously. What do you think? Do you think that 
that shit i totally forgot what i was gonna say don't don't cut that part out <laughs> no. it happens to the best of us Corey. no one's cutting that part out there's no one, <laughs> no no one edits anything <laughs> no. but i mean i think i think um we have to find a way to make the positive shit mean way more than that negative shit mm -hmm. like and and um my old partner my old my old tag partner uh my one of my best friends matt bomboy uh him and his him and his wife were telling me about this uh comedy documentary that like they were telling me about it but like since i found it and it's awesome and i love it and it's uh vince falls vince vaughn's wild west comedy tour oh that, dude In uh, incredible it's so cool yeah. but there's the one part where john caparulo does the thing where he's like oh anybody who worked at fast food and then some and then a guy in the back screamed fuck yeah and then and then he thought they said fuck you and he was like oh you got a problem man you got a problem you need to go outside and like <laughs> like yeah calm it down and then he got in the back and they're like what the fuck was that guy's problem and they're like oh he said he said fuck yeah and he was like oh and <laughs> so matt's wife was like that's just like you guys it, like we are just like that in the ring like like we, we're looking out for everybody else is laughing and having a good time or everybody else is cheering and having a good time one person one person breaks breaks the 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 good flow going mm -hmm. it's like we we gotta have we gotta have we gotta have vibe rules yeah posted yeah oh 100 percent, dude that that uh, a story of how accurate that is i will never forget this show i did a show one time at like a coffee shop and it was a really good show and i had a good set but there's a guy in the front row in a monster t-shirt with his arms just folded the whole time like this and just like not laughing not smiling just staring straight at the stage and uh uh what at one like the people are laughing but i keep focusing on this guy and at one point he like he like chuckles and he puts his head down and i was like i fucking saw that i made you laugh i mm -hmm. did it it was the best <laughs> feeling ever <laughs> um i you know like helium sometimes does the the free ticket giveaway stuff like yeah. sometimes they'll the, the, like part of the, they'll get a text message and be like, "Hey, get free tickets to this." I mm -hmm. got free tickets to see um, Rachel Feinstein when she mm -hmm. was in Philly, and I brought my friend Steve, and uh, she got up on stage and she was talking, and he like he pushed his chair out and went, "Not funny," and I was like, "What are you, you, you like not loud enough?" Not loud enough for her to hear it, but loud enough for me to be embarrassed. Yeah. I was like, dude, I'm with you. Stop. <laughs> sh shut up. Yeah, I would have been like, security, take this man out of here. Yeah, hey, get out of here. Someone kick this guy out. I don't know who he is. <laughs> but, but yeah, vi yeah, there definitely should be like a vibe expectation. Yes. You know, <laughs> and I think, you know, as like as somebody who does a lot of hosting and stuff like that for like shows and mics and everything, that's my goal as the host, right? Like the jokes that I'm going to tell to open up the show fully depend on the vibe of the comedians I'm with. Right. If I have, you know, if I'm opening and, and two of the three comedians, if I'm opening or hosting and two of the three comedians on the show are like mostly clean, non-sexual guys, I am not going to do any masturbation stuff. I'm not going to do any jokes about my dick. I'm not going to do anything like that. And the same goes if I am with like very blue comics and I'm opening and hosting for them. I am going to rip that bandaid off. I'm going to be vulgar and I'm going to be blue and I'm going to prepare the audience for that expectation because I've been on one too many shows where that vibe wasn't set. You know, you open with this squeaky clean cookie cutter guy who's like super safe and like doesn't even say a bad word in his set. And then the guy who goes up after him is like, y'all ever fuck a lady in her butt? And the audience is like, no, we haven't. <laughs> like, it's just like. I, 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 I can say that any time, like anytime in any song or in comedy or like somehow there's some part of anytime something like 
overly sharing with sexual stuff, I get uncomfortable. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I just like, I just, I'm like, but <laughs> the, the funny thing is like, when sex stuff is happening, I'm like, oh, I could make this a bit. Oh, I could turn that into it. Like, yeah. that's my, my brain does that because I've like listened to lots of comics who do get filthy, like yeah. uh, like Louis C.K., uh, one of my favorites. And uh, <laughs> yeah, but I I don't do any jokes about my dick at all. I don't do any, but I I have ideas for jokes about my dick, but I don't yeah. uh, think I'd ever do them. Yeah. See, my personal thing is like it has to be. There has to be more to it like i'm not like my joke isn't going to be just about masturbating it's go, like i have a joke about masturbating that i like doing that's like a six or seven minute long bit but that's because it starts off with being like i got bored with regular masturbation so i started doing different things and then it goes then it becomes a listicle where i like found an article online that was like a homemade male sex toys and then the bit is just exploring those like <laughs> it's exploring all of those options and um you know kind of similar to before we started the show here and you were asking me you know is anything off limits is that's like especially as an entertainer for sure i just i made no holds barred person just because like i you know i kind of want to have access to all those things so like I have sexual stuff if that's what's working. I have clean stuff if that's what's working. I have family stuff if that's what's working. You know, so I, I have all of this sort of material that I can, like, work through and just sort of, like, have have these different modes to fit them into. Um, <clears throat> but, like, like I said, it's never just, like, yeah, I jerk off. Isn't that weird? There's always a lot more to it, you know? <laughs> Even, like... One one of my favorite jokes you you heard it at the show that we did for Russell. What a good guy Russell Austin is. Uh, yes. Um, but like my one he, joke. Russ, Russell's been on this podcast before. So yeah. so is Bill Miller. So yeah. Shout out to Bill Miller and to Russell for both being previous guests on this podcast. Uh, but the uh, the pr the joke I have about porn. I have one joke. Of, I have two jokes about porn. But they are like to set up a historical joke and not they are like I view them as like jokes about American history first and jokes about porn second. You know what I mean? Like the way I the way I view that joke in my head is like this is more about history than it is about <laughs> pornography. I I um one thing uh I, I had one thing that I was doing uh, that had some sexual stuff and I had kind of stopped doing it. I, and it's sometimes it, it 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 gets like no reaction, so I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna cut this. Yeah. But I was like, oh, after after I had uh, sex with when I had sex with a woman for the first time, and she she turned to me and she was like, you know, it's different about you than every other guy I've ever dated. And I was like, what? And she's like, you don't have skid stains in your underwear. And I was like, that's more <laughs> of a you thing. Than yeah, a me yeah, thing. <laughs> yeah. That's a really low bar that you set for yourself. <laughs> that's the you. That's fully a you thing yeah. and not a me thing at all. I thought you were gonna give me a compliment about me. That's yeah. a you thing. I can't believe that doesn't work. That's so funny, <laughs> right. and I feel like it's relatable. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. That's really. I I like that. That's good. I uh, yeah. It's it's just like there is an awkwardness and like. I think a lot of the discomfort for people doing jokes that are sexual in nature is that like it requires a little bit of the audience imagining you doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and then so they have I, the picture of what that would look like. Yeah. Like uh -huh. I have <laughs> the setup of the, the masturbation joke is one of the things I talk about is uh, masturbating with a toilet paper tube. And then uh, the the punchline of the joke is the weirdest thing about doing it isn't actually the act of doing it. It's the way your dick knocks around inside the tube like old shoes in a dryer waiting to get hard. And that gets a laugh because it's just like it creates a fun picture in your mind. Like you imagine the tube and the shoes tumbling around in it. You know what I mean? Like, and I, you know, I fully acknowledge that that is forcing the audience to think about my penis and a tube of empty toilet paper. But it's i i don't know not having an imagination maybe i maybe i need to like get clearance from people who do but to me very funny mental image <laughs> can can i lend a possible tag mm -hmm. always 
when, when you were talking about the listicle thing, yeah, uh, and you were like, um, you re reading was like, um, home homemade male sex toys. Mm -hmm. You were like, my opinions. Who wants to hear my opinions on homemade male sex toys? And you'd be <laughs> like, you'd be like, I think they're gross. <laughs> Lee underrated. Yeah. Like it's like a little misdirect there. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Because uh, the the setup right now is that the website is like, if MacGyver got locked inside a Walmart for a weekend, <laughs> that that's what that's the way I set it up. But I I like that a lot. Grossly underrated. That's fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm just I. For I, me, I do like the MacGyver getting locked inside a Walmart, but I mean, yeah, they can exist together. But but also but also like there's. There's sex stuff at Walmart. You can buy yeah. sex stuff at Walmart, right? <laughs> yeah, um, you can now. Um, maybe like a maybe a Home Depot. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> and then and then also also thinking like the the way the the paint can yeah. knocks around like <laughs> like your dick inside the and yeah. your dick inside the toilet paper. Yeah. Bah, 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 that works. Sense. That's so funny. What an image. <laughs> but yeah, I think you know for me going back to that whole comedy as therapy sort of discussion that we had you know a little bit ago is that the reason why i'm okay talking about that stuff on stage is because of it it's like taking back power you know what i mean i talk about depression on stage i talk about anxiety on stage i talk about sex on stage because it like takes power and kind of destigmatizes that stuff and i'm a, I'm a big fan of that like uh you know i have i have various mental health problems but i always speak very very openly about them because I think in darkness is where they fester. So if you shine light on it, it... normalizing something that's abnormal for mm -hmm. sure. Like, um, I think uh, I, this this uh, this motivational speaker, this this uh, this speaker and uh, author, he's been on my podcast. His name is Nate Evans Jr. And he has this this phrase that he puts. It's like I think it's the name of his podcast now, and he has like T-shirts says "Change What We Normalize," mm. and I think like th that I I've met I've taken that to apply to like every like philosophy now, and I'm like, yeah. I can't tell you how grateful I am that I heard that, mm -hmm. and and now I now I try to apply it to anything. It's like, oh, are we normalizing compassion? Yes, let's continue to normalize compassion. Yeah, like, that's such such a positive message my uh so, someone who i used to date was um was she was like going in on this this girl on her twitter profile and she was like why does she have she her why does she have her pronouns on there it's like she's not in the she's not she's not in the community she's not in the lgbt community like she was like I'm like maybe she's normalizing that you do that yeah. Like, so it's not so abnormal when you see somebody who's in that community doing that. Yeah. So, oh, for sure. And when I made when I made that argument, I automatically changed my Twitter profile to having my pronouns in it. Yeah. And I was like, Yeah, would absolutely want to want to make everything that is so hard to understand a little easier to understand. Yeah. And, and sometimes it not every single thing. Not you don't deserve an explanation for every little aspect of every little thing that's going on with everybody. Yeah, you have no right. You right. you you only have a right to what people are willing to share. Um, which is why I share everything. <laughs> I'm like, I uh, I'm very like meeting new people. I do feel like I can be a lot, but it's because I'm such an open book right off the bat. Like, I'm not gonna hide anything because I honestly like. My philosophy is that I don't want to like fuck around and find out in like six months I don't like you as a person. So mm -hmm. like right off the bat, when I meet somebody, I'm going to talk about trauma. I'm going to talk about what my parents did to me. I'm going to talk about, you know, growing up and the difficulties I had and, you know, what mental health issues I have and all that shit. Because like I don't want to find out in six months that like I, I don't like you as a person. You know what I mean? Like I, I've had family members who like, I didn't know they were racist till I was like 26. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I definitely don't want to have that happen with a friendship. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't want to find out that somebody I was a close friend with is like a terribly racist or homophobic person 
any later than I can. Like I, I, so I just get out ahead of all of it. That is my philosophy. I'm like, I'm like very open. I'm again, open the most open book I can be. (laughs) Yeah. So I, I think I could be wrong, but I think what I was going to say earlier when I was forgetting had to do, (laughs) had to do with, the 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 silence in in the moments in between between laughs and yeah. between between like a like when a move happens in in a match this those silences are are still like my the my biggest nerves exist in that mm-hmm. and uh, when when a silence doesn't get broken up by laughter then i'm ridiculous it's 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 so difficult to dig myself up out of that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I've done it, but it's not easy. <laughs> oh, no. And I, I don't know how you are, but I'm in those moments. I'm like a spiraler. I will mm-hmm. like I will like start to kind of go a little bit out of control, you know, trying to like grasp at anything. You know, the again, if I had an imagination, this is how I would imagine it. But in that moment, it's like those scenes you see in movies where somebody's falling and literally like glass grasping at the cliffside for anything they can fit their fingers into, you know, is that's kind of, that's what happens in comedy when I, when that sort of thing happens is I'm just like, I'm just grabbing for whatever I can. And, and then that sometimes just makes it worse. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I well, wish I was I've, more comfortable I've, in the I've, Have you ever watched somebody bomb and you'd be like, yeah, you need this. Not only mm. do you need this, but you kind of deserve this. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, I'm a firm believer while bombing sucks. I think it's so cathartic because it like it recalibrates your systems. You know what I mean? Like if I go too long without bombing, I, I stop believing that I'm funny. So every once in a while, you know, you need a good one to reset yourself. And there is like I've I'm a petty person. I'll admit that first and foremost. And I have seen people that I'm like, oh, yeah, you needed that. Well, it's like, well, like sometimes also it's like, is this going to, is the, per, is this person going to come back from how harsh this bomb is? Yeah. And, uh, if they don't. Yeah. Uh, well, you're, you're, you were not part of the solution. Yeah. I, I do. I will say, I do feel much different regarding that when I'm looking at things as a host and not a performer, like a host, I hate nothing more than than seeing anybody bomb because that makes my life harder. Right, you gotta, uh, you gotta you gotta dig out of that. Yeah, very selfish person in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I'm on, like if I'm on the show or if I'm just one of the comedians at the open mic or whatever, yeah, there's been plenty of times where I'm like, I you know, because it's humbling. It is like I've 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 literally had conversations with like comedians that I like but are very full of themselves after a set they bombed and they got off stage and they're like, wow, I really fucking bombed up there. And I'm like, yeah, you did like it, I don't know what it was about tonight, but you did. And that's okay. Uh, I, I watched that guy bomb and he was doing, he was doing a bit about, he was like, I'm confessing right now. I'm a pedophile. I touch kids and it was bombing. And I was like, did this ever not bomb? Like, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I was like, I hope I never see this guy ever again. I, I was like, this guy must have never, ever done comedy before, and I hope that he never comes back. Yeah, I don't understand how that joke gets past day one. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't understand how you write that joke and then you're like, I'm gonna give it a try. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run it past some people, and yeah. everyone, everyone goes, Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Like, you got some shitty friends if you were like, Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, dude, it's. <laughs> it's so crazy. I had one of the one of the worst experiences I've ever had in comedy. What I was hosting an open mic, and uh, a comedian went up on stage, and uh, you know this person was pretty mentally unwell for sure. But they said, uh, it, and it, it was a white woman, and they said, uh, "How many times do you think I've been called an N word, but said the N word and with a hard R?" And I was like, "Woof." And uh, nobody in the audience responded. 
and then said it again and nobody responded. So then started like undressing and doing this like interpretive dance and then asked it a third time. And then we shut the mic off and took her off stage. Uh, and it was like really like literally sucked the air out of the room. Like it turned into a vacuum. Um, and one of this is simultaneously one of the worst things I've ever seen. And one of my proudest moments in comedy was getting that room back. Um, so uh, the open mic I was guest hosting, they always ask a question for the comedians. And the question that night that I wrote was, what would your comedy superlative be? You know, most handsome, most likely to be the president, blah, stuff like that. Uh, so earlier in the day, uh, a student from the local university came uh, who is from Nepal. And he wrote his question, most likely to be mistaken for a Chinaman. And when I read that, I was like, just so you know, I'm not saying this. These are his words. And I'm grossly uncomfortable saying this. So then after that set of the lady saying the N word, uh, I got up on stage. I let it breathe for a minute. And then I said, and I thought Chinaman was the most racist thing that was going to be said on stage tonight. <laughs> and the and like you want him back with that line. It broke the tension in the room so well. Uh -huh. Like everyone, like every butthole in the room released in that moment. And I was like, whoo, because because we had half of a show left. And I was like, this is gonna be a bad rest of the night if I can't get them to laugh with this. Uh Speaking of speaking of buttholes tightening up, um, <laughs> I I had I had a bit that I I was doing only only for like the weeks that Bohemian Rhapsody was out in the movie theater. Yeah, uh, and I said, anybody see Bohemian Rhapsody? And people, and some people were like, ah, well, it's smattered smattered all over the place. And I was like, uh, about about like twenty minutes in the movie, F uh, Freddie Mercury has his first gay kiss with this guy. And you and, and I, I saw the movie twice. I went to the movies and saw it twice. You could feel everyone's butthole like get real tighten up when when they when they kissed for the first time. And uh, and I had to I had to stay in the theater and watch it a second time. So when the movie comes to that part again, when it gets all quiet in there, I go gay. <laughs> 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 i didn't really do that but i was, I was yeah. picturing how trolly really, it would be very yeah, you, very gray fabe on that one very yeah. gay fabe <laughs> yeah i would say i've got pretty strong gay fabe <laughs> i would say i i had a i honestly dude one of the one of the absolute most devastating things a student has ever said to me is a student this year asked me, they were like, can I speak to you for a second privately? And I was like, oh, my heart, they want to confide in me about something. I'm mm -hmm. so honored. And they were like, when I first came to the school, I thought you were a lesbian. And I was like, weird. And they were like, and then you started talking and I thought you were a gay man. And I was like, yeah, you and my entire family, kid. <laughs> How does he think this is going to serve you to tell you this information? Yeah, I know. That's what I said. I was like, what was the purpose of that? They were like, I just wanted you to know. And I was like, okay, so I give off very femme, gay energy. I guess good for me. Cool. <laughs> I appreciate the info. Thank you for that. <laughs> I guess I'll assess moving forward. I don't know. You know the Mitch Hedberg joke when he's like, the guy, the guy stopped him in the airport and said, hey, I saw you on David Letterman yesterday. And he's like, but he didn't specify whether it was good or not. So I turned around and I turned back around and I said, hey, I saw you at the airport a couple minutes ago. <laughs> you were good. Oh. <laughs> so it, good. It, was, it really served zero purpose to, to share yeah. that with you. Yeah, uh, it, it really was just to like, I get it off your chest, I guess. Like, thank you for that. But yeah, my life is, I mean, I got a bit out of it. It's fun. Cause I had a bunch of like, I have, I have just a set. I have like a couple of minutes about just weird interactions I've had with students this year. Like I, for the first time I've ever had a student call me mom and uh, he did not live that down. <laughs> uh, and then I had a, another student, uh, a, a student who wasn't mine, but an autistic support student walk past and slap my butt and say, wow, booty looking so big. So mm -hmm. then every day for like two weeks, all of my teenage uh, high school students, every time I would turn around to the whiteboard, would say, wow, booty looking so big. 
<laughs> and I was like, guys, you can't say this to me. I'm going to lose my license. I, you, I don't think you're ready for this jelly. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I simply don't. Uh, do you ever think about? Do you ever think about, like, the impacts? Like, and like, sometimes, like, I say this a lot. Like, when I'm when I'm a kid, and my my father says words, and I hear those words. I'm a little kid hearing those words. So the second they left his Ma the, the second they lift his mouth, he doesn't think about them ever again. But it's something that imprints in me, and I'll, and I'll 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 carry that with me for like, oh, that that's where that's that was a little bit of trauma. Thanks, pop. Like, <laughs> uh, do you think about that when it comes to when it comes to like students, or when it comes to like your reactions to how students would say stuff to you, like that student coming up to you and saying that, like, were you were you were, were you cautious of what how you reacted to that kind of thing based off of the trauma that could be caused? Yeah, for sure. I definitely I didn't want to I didn't want to mock the student at all. Mm -hmm. So what I did was I just kind of I flipped it on to be a joke about me. Like I did genuinely say to her, yeah, you and my family both. And then she laughed really hard and it was, you know, it was fine. Mm -hmm. Um but I definitely I mean that's the one thing truthfully like the the silver lining in like the years and years that I've been a teacher has been like the handful of kids that I have had any amount of impact on. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's, there's no, there's no better feeling than like when a kid stumbles along across my like Instagram or like uh, I had it happen once on a Twitch stream where like one of my students was like looking for people playing among us. And I was like, Oh my God, Mr. William, it's you. What the heck? Like, how's it, what, what's going on? So like, that was really cool. Um, cool. you know, so like that is very rewarding. And I, uh, I'm also a, a keeper of things, you know, not, I'm not a hoarder, but like I have from when I taught seventh grade, uh, a kid, uh, that I had a very strong bond with, uh, we bonded over basketball and me teaching him how to tie a tie. And he hand wrote me a letter and gave me a tie on my last day at his school. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I every once in a while, will, whenever I need to cry, I will read that letter that he wrote me. Um, you know, it was, it, you know, so <laughs> that that is like, it's such, you know, I, and you know, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it isn't a little egomaniacal. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it, it is huge like boost to ego to think that like there's a human being on this planet that still thinks about me that isn't directly tied to me is a is a good feeling right. um but yeah i love i i love that when when like I, i'll get an instagram dm from like a kid i taught like four years ago that is like dude how are you doing like everything good are you still teaching like gosh you know, social studies was so much fun you know, being an adult, like recently I had a kid who was like, he's 19 now. And he's like, dude, being an adult is hard. And I was like, I hate to break it to you, buddy. It only gets harder from here. It's, it's and he was nice. like, oh, he was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, no, this is just this is just the beginning. It gets better. It gets way better. Yeah. <laughs> just wait. <laughs> but yeah. It, and like. Comedy is kind of the same way. There's no like, there's no feeling quite like somebody recognizing you or remembering you from seeing you perform. You know, I've had it. I've had like people see me at the store who are like, "Oh my god, hey, how's it going?" And I'm like, I have no. My we'll walk away. And my fiance will be like, "Who was that?" And I'll be like, "I have no clue." So I just can only assume that it is somebody who saw me do stand up. Um, you know, or I'll have like a, you know, uh, I go back to a venue you know, that I haven't performed at for like six months. And they're like, it's so good to have you back. Like oh, it's, cool. a, it's such a rewarding like to thing. Remembered like that. Yeah. The, the, you know what people always come up to me in stores and say, hmm. uh, where do you keep, where do you guys keep <laughs> the, like, the people always think I work everywhere I am. Every, anytime I'm anywhere, people think I work there. Dude. It, I, I, it's the same. I think it's just like demeanor. I think mm -hmm. being, are you what, are you, do you walk around with a smile on your face most of the kinda, time? Like, yeah, kind of. Yeah. yeah. I'm the same way. And, and like, it drives my fiance nuts because it happens to me all the time where like, we'll be in a grocery store 
and like somebody will walk up and be like could you tell me where the creamed corn is and i will like walk to the end of the aisle with that person and look up at the all the signs and be like looks like it's aisle three i hope it's aisle three and then they'll go that way and like i because i don't have the heart to be like i don't know i don't work here like i'm not going to do that it's no effort it's it's so so little effort for me to help that person so i'm just going to help that person but like it also happens like i i shop at the target that i worked at when i was in high school and college Mm -hmm. and i think that they're like i live in just a small enough area that so many people shop there that it's just like they remember seeing me 10 years ago at that target and they're like he must still work here (laughs) (laughs) excuse me can i borrow your keys yeah. What? 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 <laughs> when I, when I was first starting doing comedy, like when I first I tried to write a joke where I talked about like a woman coming up to me at Redner because this super this is a true story. This really happened. A woman came up to me in the Redner's the the supermarket. One second. Sure. Sorry, I my uh, my fiance's stepdad has uh, a large animal in the garage that he needs help taking care of, and <laughs> he called me, and then I texted her to be like, "Can you call him and see what he needs?" So, um, is there a way we can put this on pause for like 15, 20 minutes, yeah, or do you want to wrap it up I... here and we can do another episode later, like another day? It's an hour twenty one. Yeah, yeah, dude. Um... You got? Do you got like another five minutes? Yes. Yeah, I can give you five. Uh, okay. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Hypothetically, I've gifted you this show. <laughs> this, this is the first episode of your new show, Evolving with Chris William. Yes. In a very Jerry Springer's final thought type of way, all the the most important takeaways and the lessons that people can learn in order to become a better version of themselves tomorrow than they are today. So, oh man, that's tough. Um, I think the biggest piece of advice I would give people, and that is because it is the biggest piece of advice that has helped me, and that is never be afraid to forgive yourself or anybody else. Um, You know, uh, we're all just trying our best even the people who hurt us are still trying their best and uh life is far too short to hold grudges um to harbor hate so forgive yourself and everyone around you for the most part people don't suck on purpose yeah except for hitler (laughs) except for hitler (laughs) on purpose sucker that guy (laughs) Do you do any impressions at all? Uh, no. So I'm I'm so bad at impressions because it's one of the things with Aphantasia is I can't I can't think of the voice. You've so got I just no gotta dreams. Kinda, like try it. Mm-hmm. Um, I just gotta wing it. Uh, the one that I think I have, but it only sounds like I have it to me, is Meatwad from from Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Oh man, didn't someone just do that on the show? Yeah. Shoot. All right. Well, you got to do it now. All right. All right. And you um, say, be fun, have safe, keep evolving. All right. And and take care of, and then take care of that animal in the garage. Whatever that saying. animal is, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, take care, have fun, and keep evolving. No, take fun, have care, and keep evolving. Good enough. <laughs> I tried my best. I couldn't remember it. Short term memory. It's uh, bad. Thank you. I do a Hitler impression. No, this video. I will not do that. <laughs> Well, you could just say something as benign and help, like harmless. Like you could, you could say, like a pass, pass the biscotti or something. <laughs> oh man, thank you so much for having me, Corey. I appreciate this it. This is so great, much. man. I just want to make sure I say on to record because, um, you know, it it was it was really cool that we got this time, and it's really it, I really appreciate how much time you spent with me. I really think when you when you speak about. Uh, comedy being your career and it being a thing that works for you. Um, whether that happens or not, I want you to know that I believe it can happen for you and Aww. you deserve and you deserve that. 
Thank you, man. And I, you're I you're that. a fucking star to me. Thank like you, a dude. Re- really, really, really funny comic, and oh. you deserve it, man. You deserve so, to, so to have everything. Dude, thank you. And I, I feel the same way about you. I, I just, you. I'm so joyous thank that I've met you, and uh, you're such a good person, and I appreciate your support. Um, and the positive, the positivity you bring, um, Bill, before I go, <coughs> it is twitch.tv slash up and up pod. That is our Twitch link. Uh, and then, uh, you can go follow it there. I appreciate you ha- being interested and Corey, again, thank you so much for giving me this platform. I thanks hope you have the, me back. Thanks for the currency of your effort and your time. Everybody who's watched this whole time, I appreciate you. Thank you. Make sure you know, Chris, you're never alone. If you ever feel like you just need a friend, you need to talk. I'm always here. I'm not a hard person to get a hold of for anybody listening. That it, that that gesture goes towards you too. Be kinder to yourselves. Be kinder to everybody you know. Give everybody some grace. Be fun. Have safe. Keep evolving.